For a long time, they were just stones, but those days are gone. You can use a gua sha stone not only as an anti-aging tool, but also to do something good for your skin and relax your facial muscles. Some are supposed to help against wrinkles. Others, so they say, are for happiness. Lots of different crystals. And spirituality. I really believe in it. Minerals and crystals have become big business, but looking behind the scenes is difficult. We hope you understand, but we do not comment on our suppliers. We want to understand what's behind this trend and where these stories come from. It's not okay. It shouldn't be okay. Who pays and at what price? We're on our way to Hanover to find out more about this trend that's become so popular on social media. I personally love crystals. I feel like they hold a very, very, very beautiful energy. Influencers show us how to use facial rollers and guasa stones. And then out to the side. Roll over the area under your eyes and get that lymphatic fluid moving. From your eyelid to your ear. Seven times per side. And then you won't need anti-aging creams anymore. And even stars are talking about these stones. Hi, Vogue. I'm Claudia Schiffer. I'm Bill. I'm Bad Moms Jay. And today I'm going to show you what's in my bag. And reveal their favorites in stylized clips. Lots of different crystals. This one's in the shape of a heart. This is, this is rose quartz, energy for love and self love. I seem like I'm not the type for it, but I do have this. Will we also find this trend here at the Crystal Trade Show in Hanover? Stones as far as the eye can see, and lots of rose quartz. What brought you here today? I came with my wife. She's interested in minerals and crystals for their various spiritual effects. She uses them while meditating. Normally, there are just classic stone collectors here, but there are also new fans. As kids, you collected them as a hobby. But I think, especially in our generation, we're refinding the effects all of these stones have on you. Right. And especially in our generation, there's a lot on social media about crystals and what they can do. I think that's why there's this renewed interest. Mm -hmm. What kind of crystals do you have at home? I have stones and jewellery, stones that go on desks and, yeah, also jewellery. And you also have facial rollers or guasa. Yeah, rose quartz. Exactly, rose quartz. How did you become aware of these crystals? Where did you learn about them? Social media. They're trending right now, especially on TikTok. These new guests even have a name here. We call them our TikTok girls. They're between 12 to 17 or 18. Some come after school, some even before. And they're pretty keen to buy. They like the classics like rose quartz, amethyst, or the famous gypsum selenite. We actually suddenly sold out of those favorites last year, between March and June. Also green aventurine. We were baffled. If you have time, could you show me on TikTok? Sure. There are also people who talk about their benefits and the best way to use them. Do you know rose quartz? Rose quartz is the stone for everything to do with love. In posts that make big promises, these crystals are touted as esoteric marvels. Gemstones with healing properties are trendy right now. This is rose quartz. It's a really wonderful crystal. 
it's calming and is something of a protective crystal. It helps us develop compassion and it can also help open our heart chakra. I really believe in it because for me, there's no reason not to believe in it. Many of the people we speak to here in Hanover also believe in the crystal's reputed powers. The demand for these stones is growing, but where exactly do they come from? One place in particular is on a lot of labels, Madagascar. <laughs> Many of the retailers don't want to talk about their suppliers on camera. But we find one who does. Where do you get your stones from? Do you go to the countries directly, or how does it work? No, I have good wholesalers in Germany who have contacts in those countries. For example, this rose quartz is high-quality rose quartz from Madagascar, cut in Madagascar. But you should know that the conditions there are very, very poor. The people are bearers, or shepherds by profession. There's no education system like ours. People have to start hauling stones at the age of 14. That's their job. So you would say this is a kind of developmental support? It's support within the framework of what's possible in their culture. If the country develops, then the social system will too. But usually little support reaches countries in the global south. Instead, they mainly serve as cheap suppliers of raw materials. Miners often work under dangerous conditions, something that's been a problem for a long time. A landslide in a mining region in northern Myanmar has killed more than 90 people, according to authorities. Many more are still missing. The jade industry is lucrative, but hardly any of it reaches the people living here. Dusty hot gold mines in Niger, considered to be among the world's worst places to work. Only children can fit in the narrow shafts. It is hunger that drives most families here, forcing them to risk their lives every day in the illegal mines. We can't find much on rose quartz mines in Madagascar, except for an article in the British newspaper The Guardian about the mining. According to this, the mining conditions are devastating. We investigate further and find out that based on export volumes, Madagascar is one of the world's top three export nations of precious and semi-precious stones. The country sells quantities almost as large as export giant Brazil. How is it that a relatively small country exports so much? And do stones from Madagascar also end up in Germany? To find out, we asked large German companies which countries they get their rose quartz products from and who their suppliers are. Thank you very much for your email. We hope you understand, but we do not comment on our suppliers. Great. Other companies didn't respond at all. I hate these hotlines. Yeah, so our messages to the companies didn't really bear fruit. They were all tight-lipped or didn't respond at all. We decide to have a look at the situation directly in Madagascar. But that's not so easy. The embassy does not issue visas for filming without prior approval from the relevant authorities in Madagascar. And then here's a long list of required documents which took a while. I'm extremely stressed because we're flying Saturday morning. It's Thursday today and we still don't have a visa and for that we need a shooting permit. We've been told for three days that it's on its way, but it's still not here. In the end, it all worked out. Just in time. Madagascar is the largest island in the Indian Ocean. The country is around as big as France, its former colonial power. We landed in Antananarivo, Madagascar's capital. (laughs) 
Our colleague Holly picks us up at the airport. She's been researching this topic for a long time and she knows a lot about mining in Madagascar. The plan was for her to accompany us for the whole trip, but she wasn't the only one. On the very first morning, Madagascar welcomed us with a chaperone who works for the Ministry of Communications. Olivia was to accompany us from now on. This was a condition for us to be allowed to film. Holly was also there that morning and helped us out by interpreting. I was wondering if it's like normal that film teams have to take someone from the ministry with them. It's very normal, very normal to do that. It protects them, it protects each of us and our jobs. Yes, we are their companions, but we're not only that. We are also facilitators, especially for these teams, as we are agents of the state. We make things possible, help speed up processes, for example, when going somewhere. Yeah, I liked strangers. What a strange situation. We just met the woman who will be accompanying us the entire trip. We have to see what the smartest move is now. We've come up with a few plans to lose her because we clearly can't have her with us when things get a bit tricky. No one at the mines will talk with us freely if there's someone from the ministry standing next to us. We had initially planned to go directly to a mining area, but we decide it's better to take Olivia to a more harmless place first in the hopes that we can find a way to go without her. We started with an innocuous tour of the capital. We needed two cars because our complete team, driver, interpreters and Olivia were coming along. It quickly became apparent that things are very different when you're in such a large group. It makes it much harder to have normal conversations with people on the ground. I have to say, I'd rather it were just the two of us walking through the streets. The woman from the ministry is also wearing a bright blue vest with the word media on the back, so everyone knows, OK, they're here. It actually says media supervision. It's just very obvious. Very obvious. <laughs> this is not undercover. <laughs> We drive back to the hotel to meet with someone who works for Transparency International Madagascar. Valérie oversees everything to do with mining at Transparency International. He tells us the miners' situation is a most urgent problem. The number of miners are increasing every year. Okay. So we, we, we have up to 500,000 people that are working in the mining sectors. But we don't know, we don't have a full detail about, the, about their numbers and, or their identity. So that's, that's also one of the problems. We don't know who they are. They're just flocking from here to here and moving from one location to another. We learn from Valérie that currently most mining in Madagascar takes place without a permit, also because the government put a freeze on new permits in 2011. Around 80% of mines are therefore makeshift or artisanal, with human bodies rather than machines pulling the crystals out of the ground. We wanted to go and see these mines, but we were worried our state agent chaperone could cause problems for the workers especially as immediately after our interview, she went to question Valérie and took notes. It's a very strange situation. I went over to find out what she's doing. She's asking him what he told us. To be honest, I'm a bit stressed because I told him that we wanted to go to the mines. Luckily, Olivia doesn't hear about those plans. To be on the safe side, instead of going to the mines, we go to the coastal town of Tuamasina. This town is the most important trading port in Madagascar. 
We want to find out what routes the rose quartz takes, from the mines to the port and from here to all over the world. We need three permits to be allowed to shoot in the port. We'd submitted the applications before our trip. But the port director doesn't accept the verbal agreement from customs. So we have to leave the premises. Instead of being able to observe rose quartz being loaded onto the ships and interviewing workers and exporters, we find ourselves back outside the port facility. I'm a bit annoyed because now we can't go to the port, even though we were initially told we had all of these 20,000 necessary permits. Olivia, our supervisor from the Ministry of Communications, also wasn't able to help us, contrary to what she'd said. And that wasn't all. So it turned out that this woman tested positive for COVID, which made the ridiculous situation even more absurd, because she started coughing two or three days ago. Fortunately, we were still testing negative, so we continued on our journey heading to Ancira Bay. Olivia had to go into quarantine, meaning we were able to go to the Rose Quartz mines without her. Our base was in Ancira Bay, the largest city in the region. Travel times in Madagascar tend to be long, so we set off early in the morning. It's around 5 a.m. I'm still really tired. We're going to the mines now. It's a three-hour drive plus a walk. Let's see what awaits us. In any case, things are tense. According to the World Bank, about 80% of Madagascar's population lives below the international poverty line. Rural areas in particular are poor. Pretty much the only jobs here are in agriculture, or in the mines. To get to one of these mines, we have to leave the paved road. We just came to a mine that we know is run by one family, but we can't go to the mine itself, it's closed. There was an accident and someone was seriously injured. Our search continues. Our interpreter helps us ask questions as we look for a mine that's still in operation. We've just received the location of a mine and are on our way. I look like I'm on safari. And it's great. You're wearing a Jack Wolfskin backpack. How typical. My grandma gave it to me. We're not sure how people will react to us. We're almost there now. It's just 10 more minutes on foot. But we're going to first turn off the camera because we want to and should meet people without it first. But they're already expecting us. People here don't mind us visiting, and we can keep filming. Rose quartz deposits exist in various places in Madagascar. Here, it's under just a thin layer of soil. Freshly mined, the stones can be extremely sharp. This is one of the reasons why working in mines is considered one of the worst forms of child labor, and why labor laws in Madagascar prohibit anyone under the age of 18 from working in them. These two boys seem to know that. They stop when they see us filming. But later, they get back to work, carrying the heavy stones. One of them, Naina, is even willing to talk to us. He's 15 years old. My parents both work here too. I'm the eldest, and I have three younger siblings. They're over there. My parents brought me here because we don't have enough money. We asked Naina what he would like to change, if possible. 
I'd like to go back to school. In Madagascar, only 63% of children finish primary school. According to UNICEF, in 2018, one-fifth of 15 to 24-year-olds couldn't read or write. What I'd like to become? Doctor. Not all children from Naina's village go to school. We don't know how many there are. Often parents cannot afford the school fees, so they take their children with them to work. Another worker agrees to be interviewed. My name is Sis. I'm 20 years old. I feel tired because of work. We talked to him about the two younger boys working here. It's absolutely forbidden. But because the families don't earn enough, children have to help their parents. It's not okay. It shouldn't be okay. Cease experienced a similar fate. When I was 16, I dropped out of school to help my parents, because life was unaffordable. I would have preferred to go to school, but that's not how life is. Life got harder, so I had to support my parents. We've brought along a rose quartz facial roller from Germany. Have you ever seen something like this? <laughs> this is quartz. That's all you know. This is what it looks like when it's been polished by machines. This is our product after it's been mined here. Here we just dig it up and then people abroad make something like this. Is that gold around it? That's metal. Metal? And what's that for? Decoration? It's amazing. <laughs> it's like a facial roller and you have to go like this. <laughs> <laughs> Cease and the other labourers seem amused, but the mood changes when we discuss the prices such products are sold for in Europe. Sometimes they sell them for like 40 euros. Did you hear that? I'm rather shocked that it's so expensive. For me, that means the price here should increase too. The bigger the pieces the men mine, the better. They're paid 400 ariari per kilo, equivalent to around 10 cents. The price of two cigarettes in the village here. Many of the labourers live in the village with their families. According to estimates, nearly half of children in Madagascar between the ages of 5 and 17 have to work. We meet Tuf from the mine. He used to work in a gold mine. Now it's rose quartz. He shows us his home where he lives with his wife and one-year-old daughter. This is our house. This is the bedroom. This is where we cook and store things. When I started working, I began to lose weight because I had to provide for my family. My energy level went down. I could see it was not enough because I was also providing for my family. And how is it now, like at the uh, rose quartz mine? It's hard. It's hard because when there is no money, no income, we still have to live. And this is the only thing we have. So we have to work, even if it's hard. And could you imagine your kid working at the mines? I don't know. I wish they didn't have to go there. But because of this poverty, they will have to work there. They'll have to go there if there is no other job. Because without jobs, we can't really afford to send them to school. We learn that typically children here start to work in mines when they're 16, although some are as young as 13. 
Even younger than that, they help their parents in the fields. Back in the car, we feel strange. It hasn't felt right for us white, female journalists from Europe to examine people's lives here. But we also believe it's important to report on something few people are aware of. We drive to another mine. But along the way, a problem presents itself. Although Olivia is back in the capital with COVID, the Ministry of Communications hasn't let up. They've kept calling, so we've come up with an excuse. I'm now writing to the woman from the Ministry of Communications to say that we're leaving on Sunday because we had too much trouble at the start of our trip and our editors won't give us any more money and that we have to go back to Germany. So we're telling a big fat lie and let's hope she believes it. Luckily for us, there's no cell phone reception at the mines. Showing us the way there is Jimmy, because even if we don't have the ministry with us anymore, we're always either announced or accompanied by someone. This time, it's Jimmy. Jimmy is a sort of foreman at the mine. The owner hired him to supervise the work here, and now us, too. He hardly leaves our side. This mine is very remote and the deepest we visit on our trip. According to research by The Guardian, younger children are often used for digging new mines. We'd heard rumours that that's also happened here, but we can't confirm it. All the workers here say they're over 18. My name is Anjanaya Sanjaja and I am 21 years old. I started mining when I was 17 years old. A few months ago, this mine collapsed. The workers had to dig the hole again. No, no one was hurt. It collapsed while nobody was working. It collapsed when we weren't working. We ask if the work is dangerous. Yes, if you aren't careful, it is. We ask if he's ever seen someone get hurt. Yes, I did. He was in the tunnel and the rocks collapsed. Did he die? Hmm. Jimmy, the foreman, says it's rare that labourers get hurt. But that doesn't look to be the case to us. Almost everyone we've seen in the mines has cuts on their arms and legs. It's a bit heavy. When we ask what the labourers think about the working conditions, their answer sounds a bit forced. We are always careful. We recognise when it is dangerous. Then we don't go down. Aren't you worried? Well, we are worried. But this is how we earn money. So we have to do it. Another worker tells us that the work they do isn't for people, but for machines. They'd like to use machines themselves, but for that, they'd need a permit from the state. And those are too expensive and stopped being issued years ago. We ask how heavy the stones are that they have to carry. They can weigh up to 160 kilos, sometimes 120 or 110. We've seen how hard people, including those underage, have to work in mines to help feed their families, without protective clothing, without fixed working hours, and sometimes for the measly sum of just 10 cents per kilo. The longer we're here, the more absurd the hype around the stones in Germany seems to us. We're back in Ancira Bay, where many exporters who ship rose quartz worldwide are located. We have an appointment with Fidi, who sells stones from the last mine we visited. We make export and uh, we collect. So when we have water, we can buy many stones, variety of stone. He shows us his depot. The stone uh, they're around uh, 27 tonnes. 
27. Yeah. For one this container. For one container. Mm -hmm. This for uh, especially for uh, we India mm -hmm. uh, order for India. We load this uh, Saturday. Fidi has specialized in rose quartz since 2010. He shows us the containers he ships out every month. This container is full. Yeah. Like this 27 ton inside. Yeah. And uh, we put this ah, after. The seal. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here. Mm -hmm. And this is also China? Uh, no, this for, uh, to, to, to India. Who buys the most stones from you? Chinese and Indian. Mm -hmm. uh, until now, I don't have a customer for, from Europe, mm -hmm. from uh, USA, from, mm -hmm. from America. Mm -hmm. Always Chinese and uh, Indian men. He says that with rose quartz, it's easy to get large quantities quickly. It takes his miners around one month to fill one container. We ask how the demand has evolved. In 2015, uh, nobody want to buy rose quartz. Mm -hmm. One year now, this up. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know next year. Uh, this may be down because we we depending of the market in 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 China in in the big big city. The stones rarely go directly to Europe. Instead, they usually go to China or India, where they're processed. Do you think the companies who sell these products, these processed stones in Germany, do they know, can they know where the stones are from? I'm sure they don't know, because I think German traders buy in bulk from China. If asked, Chinese sellers probably wouldn't say that the stones are from Madagascar, because they would be afraid that big customers from Germany would come here directly. So I think they don't know. I'm sure they don't know. Our research in Madagascar has come to an end. We've learned a lot about the mines and the working conditions and about how important China is as a trading partner. Again and again, we were told about the many Chinese buyers. We didn't manage to talk to one in Madagascar, but official figures confirm what we were told. About half of the precious and semi-precious stones from Madagascar are exported to China. Germany is ranked fourth among export destinations with much lower trade volume. Back in Hamburg, we decide to try a different approach to get in touch with Chinese suppliers. Rather than identify ourselves as journalists, we set up a fake startup, Soa Organics, and pretend to sell rose quartz products. Our colleague Max made a website so that our story was more convincing. Why do you need a fake website? Well, because we know there are traders here in Germany and that it's extracted in countries like Madagascar. But we're still missing this intermediate step, the processing in China. So that's who we want to write to. Under the guise of our fake company, we visit a Chinese trading platform and search for companies that can supply us with 10,000 facial rollers made of rose quartz. Seconds later, our inbox explodes. We use the opportunity to ask questions, including about working conditions in the mines. My colleague wants to know if you have any information about the conditions in the mines where you get your rose quartz, some kind of certificate or something. My boss is not allowed to reveal details about our supplier because it's easy to give away secrets, which would be bad for us. I hope you can understand. Sorry to ask again, but I don't understand. You don't have any information about the mining conditions, but what about certificates for the quality of the rollers? Yes, regarding the former, it's confidential. We can't disclose that now. Do you have any information about the working conditions in the mines? Because that's quite important to us. No, we don't. No, not regarding our stones. We don't have any information. In the meantime, we'd also emailed some Chinese suppliers. Regarding information about the working conditions, 
We know you are concerned about whether the Rose Quartz is mined legally and about whether child labour is involved, but we haven't heard anything about it. We do, however, have a video of the mining. I hope that helps. Not really, because the video doesn't even show the work in the mines. As we were researching undercover, the Chinese suppliers didn't hesitate to speak with us. We even received mock photos of product samples for Soa Organics, our company, without even asking for them. But when it came to finding out more about working conditions in the mines, our fake startup didn't prove very helpful. We decided to try again in person and headed to Sainte Marie aux Mines, a small town near Strasbourg. Once a year, one of Europe's largest fairs for minerals and gemstones takes place here. Ah, guck mal, hier ist schon einmal. Look, it says Madagascar. Here again, there's a lot of rose quartz. Many retailers are aware of the risks miners face and that they earn very little, including this wholesaler from Germany. We can't pay the workers. We can only pay the owner. That's just the way it is, and it can't be changed. But if the money arrived directly at a mine, that would be better than if a wholesaler pocketed it. Do your customers care about that, or are price and quality the decisive factors? 80% price and quality. Very few people ask about it. I'd say that's our responsibility. But do retailers here live up to this responsibility? Doubtful, according to our conversation with another salesman. What do you think about the working conditions in the mines for the miners? Awful. Awful. But you buy nevertheless? Like, you know, like everyone. Like everyone. What can we do? We try, at least I try to uh, improve the condition of work of my own workers and uh, of my suppliers by paying uh, quite decent prices. But uh, what's happened on the mine, what can we do? But you see, uh, even on this small area, there is seven, at least seven, maybe eight exhibitors who are carrying Madagascan stones. And uh, I guess no one is very, very involved in what's happened on the mine. And when customers ask about working conditions or child labor, I say, OK, I can take any photos and uh, delete the one with the kids are on. That's it. And uh, what do you want to see? I will show you what you want to see and don't show you what you don't want to see. And that's it. If there are no children in the photos, there's no problem. Since January the 1st, 2023, the Supply Chain Act has been in effect in Germany, which aims to protect the rights of the people producing goods for the German market. But does it hold up to this promise? The law is supposed to force German companies to ensure labour law and environmental protection compliance throughout their supply chains. But the Act was severely weakened before it was passed. For example, it now only applies to larger companies. This is one of the reasons why we're in Schwäbisch Gmünd to talk about this with Norbert Bartler. Hallo, Herr Bartler. Nadja Mützkat. Hallo. Bartler played a key role in the Supply Chain Act for the CDU party as a state secretary in the German Ministry of Development. It was one of the most difficult legislative processes I encountered in my entire parliamentary career. Our fiercest opponent was Peter Altmaier, plus the relevant parliamentarians from the Economic Affairs Committee. They showed fierce opposition. Amongst other stipulations, we're told Altmaier objected to the following. How deep should you go? Should the entire supply chain be covered by the law or not? The business community has always said only two the first supplier level, and no further. We contacted the former Minister for Economic Affairs, Peter Altmaier, who responded that the law could only be passed because of this compromise. The new law obliges German companies to ensure human rights compliance, but with indirect suppliers only after a complaint has been filed. We have also the 
We asked big retailers, but they usually didn't answer or were very evasive. Then we pretended to be a fake startup and asked the suppliers in China. They were very willing to tell us where things came from, from which countries. But when it came to working conditions, the statement was always, we can't say. But as a German company, that would be all I'd need under the new supply chain law, right? Yeah. Yeah. In principle, yes. Then you would have fulfilled your responsibility. You asked. And if there are no suspicions, if there are no complaints or other information, then that's all that's legally required. But isn't that too little? Yes, as I said, that was one of the big points of contention. To what level of depth in the supply chain and how binding do you go? I can imagine that things will be a bit more binding in future. But for now, it wouldn't have been possible to pass a stricter law. Thank you very much for the interview. It was a pleasure. I'm still working on this. Bartler is happy to have gotten the law passed at all. But the law will not change anything for the people we saw in Madagascar, for the people in the mines. And that's a bitter pill to swallow. Because, as he said, German companies can also just use this excuse, this supply chain law, and say, we asked. But only up to the level to which they have to. And that's China, not Madagascar. So what have we learned from our research? We met people who pay a high price for products whose benefits don't justify that price. No one takes responsibility for the people at the beginning of the supply chain. They're not heard or even seen. That's almost always the story in globalization. And Germany's Supply Chain Act won't change that.